This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Okay, so this week we're looking at the traditional approach to requirements. Up until now we've looked at the object-oriented approach. Now I'm going to cover this week and next week some of the traditional methods to modelling requirements, um, which are not irrelevant and they are still being used in many cases in many organisations and they're basically a different way of representing information. Um, it's just a different viewpoint of looking at information. So a reminder that quiz three is to be completed this week and I have put the link up on the course website down here. Okay, so you can have a look at the quiz. So today we're going to be looking at, in particular, um, I guess the different views of the traditional versus the object-oriented approach. Up until now we've looked at objects um, and modelling functional requirements using the object-oriented approach, which is the new approach to information systems development. When I did my degree back in, yeah, a long time ago, um, we, I learnt, this is what I learnt, the traditional approach to modelling requirements. So data flow diagrams, structured English, decision tables, etc, etc. So giving you a taste of the traditional approach to modelling versus the object-oriented approach, which is the new approach. Nothing wrong with either approach, it's just the way times have changed. Um, Organisations are following the object-oriented approach. But it's not to your disadvantage to know and understand that there are different ways of modelling system requirements, whether you use the traditional and or the object-oriented approach. So when we looked at entity relationships diagrams, they were using the traditional modelling approach, ER diagrams, versus the um, other diagrams that we've looked at, the domain model class diagrams. So data flow diagrams um, are something else that we'll be looking at today and they're a, a way of modelling use cases and modelling processes and, and we can model those again at different levels and we'll look at the different levels in which you can model data, starting from a, a context diagram to then um, exploding those diagrams to high levels of details into subordinate data flow diagrams. So we can use data flow diagrams um, and other system models instead of use case diagrams and system sequence diagrams. So just to give you, an, um, I guess, an overview of, of where these two approaches sit. So we have events, use cases and an event table. If we use the object-oriented approach, which is what we've been looking at up until now, we can consider use case diagrams, the um, extended use case descriptions, we can look at system sequence diagrams, we've had activity diagrams, and we've looked at state machine diagrams. That's to model and represent events, use cases, and an event table. If we look at the traditional approach to modelling requirements, we can use different types of models to again gather the same, diff the same types of information. But with a traditional approach, we look at the context diagram, we look at data flow diagram fragments, we look at data flow definitions, process descriptions and other traditional models. Today we'll be looking at data flow diagrams and the context diagram. Next week we'll be looking at some other different types of process descriptions. Okay, so over the next couple of weeks we'll be looking at, at this approach as opposed to this approach. And here we have the class diagram, as I said before, to model things. In the traditional approach, we have the entity relationship diagram, which I introduced both to you when we're looking at modelling things. So a bit of a, a visual representation of the distinction in between the two and how we represent that differentiation and what we are actually representing in, in either approach. So let's have a look at data flow diagrams. Well, they pretty much graphically characterise the processes and flows in a business system. So we need to look at the inputs to the system, what processing is involved and what outputs. So we look at um, various types of things. 
the actors or the external entities that interact with the system. We look at the use cases, or we name them as processes, and what processes are involved or represented in a particular system. What information and data is flowing within the system, whether it's from an external entity into the system, whether it's amongst different processes within the system. So we're showing entities, we're showing processes, we're showing movement of data and flow of information, and we are also showing data stores. Okay, so where is the data being stored? Where is the data being retrieved from? So these are the kinds of things that we show in data flow diagrams. Uh, the advantage of data flow diagrams, um, again, similar. We can see an analysis of the proposed system. Okay, and again, there's different levels that I'll show you in terms of how much or how little information we show depending on what level of data flow diagram we are working towards, whether it's a context diagram which shows you the top level, whether it's um, levelling into further levels, which, which you'll see in a moment. So it's pretty much the under, understanding the interrelatedness of systems and subsystems. Okay, so the approach that we've got in the book is we've got a, a huge... CSMS system and it has multiple subsystems. So we can model the entire system as one or we can also provide top level views and exploited views of those subsystems, so breaking them down into smaller components or smaller parts. So it's basically another way of communicating what's going on in the system with our users. Okay, All part of gathering requirements but in a different format this time. So there are some different symbols that we can use in data flow diagrams. Um, I guess the first one is basically a process which represents pretty much a, a use case. So it's the step-by-step -step instructions um, that follow, that transform inputs into outputs, or it's a computer or a person doing the work. So what is the process that's being carried out in this particular system that we're looking at? Um, the next one is a data flow, which pretty much shows the flow of data, either moving as an input into a process uh, or, or a data store or as part of an output. An external agent, um, we could use another term like for example an actor or a stakeholder or an external entity. Um, it's the source or the destination of data outside of the system. So the external agent or the external entity is not actually part of the actual internals of the system, they sit outside of the system and they somehow interact with the system, whether it's a person or a customer requesting an invoice or making a payment, it's the external entity that's providing information into the system or receiving some sort of information out of the system. So they're not actually within the system but they're interacting with the system. A data store is basically your data arrest. So um, objects, okay, in our classes, that's the object-oriented approach. Here we call them data stores. This is where the information is being stored, a repository for later use. And these usually correspond to the um, data entities that you've created in an entity relationship diagram. So when you create an entity relationship diagram, you have a number of entities. They are what is, how we represent, or that is what is represented by a data store in our data flow diagram. A real-time link, sometimes we need to communicate with um, external agents, uh, e.g. Uh, credit card verification. So you need to, as part of the system, get some sort of verification from an external system. So when you're paying for something and you need some sort of verification, you need to actually have real-time access to another system. Okay? Um, and that basically is represented via the real-time link, which is the zigzag arrow. A double-headed arrow. So I've got, a, I've used a couple of sources for today's lecture. One being the textbook, another one being Kendall and Kendall, which is um, they are also really well-known authors in analysis and design. They are looking more so at the traditional approach. Okay, different authors use different approaches. So I've given you um, examples of both both authors and, and their take on it. So again, same sort of thing. They have an entity. An example of an entity is a student. Uh, a data flow, an example would be new student information. A process would be create student record. Notice that we name the process and we number the process. A data store could be the student master. Okay, so here's some specific examples of the top four there. 
So as I said, external entities, they represent another department, a business, a person or a machine. It's actually the source or the destination piece of the data that's entering or leaving the actual system. And they're outside the boundary of the system, should be named with a noun. So some naming conventions and some rules I'll also be providing with, with today's, um, I guess, slides. Again, the data flow shows the movement of data from one point to another, whether it's going into a particular source or leaving a particular source. Again, data flows, you describe them with a noun. They need to have an arrowhead showing the direction of that flow of data, whether it's going into a source or coming out of a source. Um, and that arrowhead does indicate the flow of direction. And it represents data uh, about a person, place or a thing. Okay? A process, again, um, denotes a change in or transformation of data. So if data is going into a process, or if the same data that goes into a process is the same data that comes out, it's not really a process because the process hasn't changed or transformed the data in any way. So something has to happen within that process once it's received some data. It's got to be processed somehow in terms of what information comes out of that process. Okay, so when we talk about process, it means something happens to the data. Um, it's changed in some sort of way. And it represents the work being performed in the system, i.e. we can think of it as our use cases. What are the doing things, the functional parts of the system? So there are some naming conventions. Um, you assign the name of the whole system when naming a high-level process. Um, to name a major subsystem, attach the word subsystem to the name and use the form, verb, adjective, noun for detailed processes. And we'll have a look at some examples in a moment. Again, a data store is a repository of information, where the information sits. Um, and again, you name that with a noun, describing the actual data. So it's got to make sense. Okay, a lot of these things have to be named intuitively to the user as well as intuitively to the designers that are designing the system and creating the system that's being proposed. Um, data stores are usually given a unique reference number, such as D1, D2, D3. Some use this convention, some don't. A uh, good way of providing consistency so you know which data store you may be referring to at a particular point in time. So some steps in developing data flow diagrams. I guess the first thing, and it's probably pretty difficult for you to read, but it uh, gives you a good step-by-step -step guide. The first thing we need to do is, I guess, make a list of the business activities that are carried out within an organisation. Okay, so you're gathering the requirements, looking at what the activities are that are going to be performed for this particular system in order to determine who the external entities are. Okay, who are the parties outside of the system that are either recipients of information of the system or they are ones that are providing the source information into the system. Then you need to consider your data flows. So what data are those external entities providing into the system? Similarly, what information is being provided by or produced by the system and received by those external entities? So you need to consider the flows going into the system as well as the flows coming out of the system. Once you're working with the system, what are the processes? What are the things that are actually being done by the system? So what are the primary functional requirements? What are the use cases, i.e. what are the processes? Um, and what data needs to be stored? Okay, what are your entities that need to be stored? In the object-oriented approach, we'd suggest what are the classes that are being used to store information. So once you know what your external entities are, the flows of data both in and out of the system, the processes that are involved in the system and the stores, you can create a context diagram um, that shows the external entities and the data flows to and from a system. Now there are only certain components that you show on a context diagram, which is the top level diagram, versus what you show when you explode that diagram into further levelling. And I'll show you the distinction and the comparison between the two in a moment. So the next level diagram is a diagram zero after you've um, drawn your context diagram and this is where you show a lot more information. You actually, rather than having one process in the middle which talks about the name of the system, you now explode that into the sub-processes and what actually goes on within the system. So there's a lot more information being shown um, 
in the diagram zero. Then you can create another child diagram for each of the processes in diagram zero and expand and explode those even further. So there's a leveling approach happening. We've got the top level, we've got our diagram zero, then we've got our diagram one level um, following all of that. One thing you need to be wary of is you've got to check for errors and make sure that the labels you assign to the processes and data flows are meaningful. Okay, so there are some rules of how you represent data flows. Um, and there are some rules of how you represent them when you actually show the different levels within your diagram. If at the context diagram level, you've got 10 flows of information coming into the system and you've got five flows or five reports, for example, coming out of the system, when you explode that system to a diagram zero or a diagram one, if you are representing those flows of information, you can't introduce new flows of information when you explode it at the, at the lower levels of, or high levels of abstraction. So if you've got 10 flows coming in, in your diagram zero, you still need to have 10 flows coming in. If you've got 10 reports coming out, in your diagram zero, you still need to have the same 10 reports coming out. You can't change the information that's coming in and out when you start levelling your diagram. So there's got to be some balancing required to make sure that your flows are the same throughout your diagrams. And again, I'll show an example of that. Then six and sevens, we probably won't um, look at those today, but there's, I mean, there's, there's quite a lot you can think about in terms of data flow diagrams. In terms of the context, or well, in terms of what we'll be looking at, I pretty much want you to have a, a good understanding at this point of uh, context diagrams. So if you're given a scenario how to draw a context diagram, and maybe diagram zero. I won't ask you to do any more levelling than that. Um, so yeah, a, a good guide using a top-down approach of developing data flow diagrams. So the context diagram is the highest level um, in a data flow diagram. It only contains one process representing the system. The process is given number zero, okay? Number zero, uh, numbering is also really important in data flow diagrams. So it's easily understood by the readers and users and developers in terms of showing which process you're actually expanding at a further level of detail. Okay, now again, you'll see an example of that. In addition to the one process, the other thing that we show in the context diagram are your external entities as well as major data flows. So pretty much the context diagram has a circle in the middle representing one process which represents the entire system, several external entities that are interacting with the system, and the data flows going into the system and the flows coming out of the system. That's pretty much all we show on a context diagram and just some basic rules. So again, a really simple example. Um, the system name here within the process, number zero, we've got three external entities. In this case, external entity one is producing or providing input A. External entity two is providing input B. External entity three is the recipient of output C. Okay, so in its simplest form, this is what a context diagram looks like. You have a system, you represent that system by the central process, you give it a system name, you label it with a zero, you identify your external entities, you show the data going in and the data coming out. Now, some of these entities could have data coming in, they could also have data coming out back to the same entity. It's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship in terms of how the data is processed by the system and how they provide and receive information from the system. But again, just a simple example. Next level diagram is called a diagram zero, where we actually explode the context diagram. Okay? A good strategy is to think about um, having not too many processes at this level. So the way you number your processes, think about them. Um, the way you name your processes, think about them. The way you categorise your processes, think about them. You shouldn't have more than nine processes. Seven plus or minus two is what we think about when we create um, level zero diagrams or diagram zeros. You number each process. Again, numbering convention is, is quite um, specific when we're doing data flow diagrams. And you can show data stores and all external entities within this diagram. Okay, so if you have, if you have an external entity in your context diagram, 
those external entities must also appear and interact with the system the with the diagram zero. As well. Sorry? And they may be external. No, the external entities just remain as an external entity. And all you pretty much show, so if we explode this diagram at the next level, we pretty much are showing a lot more about what's going on in here, um, in the actual system itself. But at some point when we show the level zero diagram, we would still see entity one providing input A. We would still show entity two providing input B, but it won't be to that particular central process, it'll be another process. Maybe entity one provide two pieces of information to two separate... And that's right, yeah, you can. This is just a real simple example. If, if, entity, if entity one provided two separate pieces of information to two separate processes, you'd have to show those two pieces of information on this diagram first. The two red lines? Yeah, yeah. Well, they're just showing red for, for whatever reason they want it to be red. Two, two lines. Yeah, so however many pieces of information entity one provides is how many lines would be at this level. And if they receive, again, you'd show it at this level. You can't introduce new flows of information when you explode the diagram, okay? Okay, so each process is numbered. You show your data stores and your external entities. Uh, we start with the data flow from an entity on the input side, work backward from an output data flow. Again, you look at the data flows to and from. Um, you make sure that all your f flows of information that are shown at the context diagram level are duplicated and shown at the diagram zero level. The only difference being, instead of having one central process with the system name, we now have some sub-processes or the use cases of what actually goes on inside the system. And here's an example to show you um, in greater detail a diagram zero. So the blue box, okay, now represents the explosion of this blue box here, okay? And we can see we've got two entities, input A and B, entity three, output C. We've got our two entities, input A and B, We've got external entity three, output C. So the top level is still represented, but we're now showing a lot more detail for our diagram zero, where we're showing some processing that goes on. So this is, again, very generic. It's not specifically labelled, but just to give an example of, of how we explode a context diagram into lower level processes. So we have four processes here. Uh, general process A, B, C and D. Um, again, we have two data stores labelled D1 and D2 and we have some information flowing between our processes um, and to and from our data stores. Again, this is what's going on inside the system. What we showed at the context diagram zero level is still also being represented at this particular level. Now, there are some rules to how data can flow to and from processes and to and from data stores, um, and some common mistakes that are made when drawing these diagrams and levelling at um, high levels of abstraction, and I'll go through those in a moment. So we do create diagrams, um, data flow diagrams at levels. Obviously, you start at the context diagram level, then you have your next level diagram, which is a diagram zero, but then you can also explode each of these diagrams to another level as well. And when you did that, would you, can, can you reuse uh, process one in general process AAA or do you have to start at process number five? So if you explode process one, everything with that would be 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. If you explode process four, it would be, again, a whole bunch of these, but it would be 4.1, 4.2. So you can see how the numbering convention uh, plays an important part in how you're levelling these diagrams because the numbering shows you which processes we're actually exploding at a finer level of detail, at a higher, greater level of detail. Now, every single one of these doesn't necessarily have to be exploded at another level of detail. It's only if it's required that you need to keep breaking it down. You shouldn't have to go like 10 levels for every process. Okay, um, but again, if you are if you are exploiting this one, 
once you explode it, you have to show record E coming out and you have to show data flow D coming in and other things going on within, with inside, inside general process you D. You have to show where the data flow D came from. So you have to show three, uh, number three is the... No. No. I, I'll check on that, but I don't think you do. You just, because then you're basically going a, a step back. So you wouldn't show three and you wouldn't show data store two, you would just show that it's coming out and, and coming in. Um, so each process on a diagram zero may be exploded to create a child diagram. And again, the numbering convention is quite important. Um, and again, following the rules, um, a child diagram cannot produce output or receive input that the parent process does not also produce or receive. So what they're saying is you can't create new things unless they're actually shown at this level of the diagram, okay? And the child process is given the same number as the parent process. So process three would explode to diagram three and the numbering would be 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 3.4 3 for each of the processes shown within that child diagram. So this gives you um, an example of the differences between the parent diagram above and the child diagram below. So above we have the parent diagram, below we have the child diagram which is an explosion of general process three and you can see it pretty much answers your question. The data store isn't the data store is included, but the external entity isn't included. And, well, and number four... Sorry? No, because you're... Um, because D5 is internal to general process triple C. Okay, so it's... You need... You're showing additional stuff in here as well as what goes on outside. Okay, so we're showing general process three has input B and we're continuing input B that comes into detailed process 3.1. Um, D5 is another data store that we're introducing within this one because we're showing it at a higher level of detail, which then provides information to detailed process triple Y, which is 3.2 which then provides flow of information to detailed process triple Z, which is 3.3. So we've got an expansion now of process three into 3.1, 3.2 and 3.3. What you need to be wary of is that input B is still input B, data flow D is still data flow D, the output flow must match the parent process, the input flow much match the, the higher process and the data store which is record A still matches. So they haven't actually shown processes or external entities but they have shown the data store. Okay so at the child diagram level and it varies amongst authors as well. Okay. At the child level, we don't necessarily show the process that it's connected to, so we wouldn't show four here, and we wouldn't show entity two over here. If we didn't show B1, it's not no, but if you didn't show record A, that would be the problem. Okay, so we need to show A, B, and D. B, A, and D. And then we're showing at a higher level of detail, um, what's going on inside general process C. So here we can see the transaction files may be added to the lower level diagrams. Okay, so it's basically showing you greater detail as you progress. A context diagram, a level zero diagram, and from the level zero diagram, we may have multiple child diagrams to show a, a greater level of detail in terms of what's going on for each of those sub-processes or subsystems within that particular system or sub-processes within that system. Um, so here you can see that basically the, the way it flows and the way it works. 
So typical errors that we see um, in data flow diagrams um, for the technique is that people forget to include a data flow or a pointing arrow um, is in the wrong direction. Okay, so the data flows must match from your top level to your diagram zero to your child diagrams. Flows coming in and out must still be represented when you do your levelling of your data flow diagrams. Um, and again, pointing arrows in the wrong direction. Another thing that you, you don't do is you can't connect data stores and external entities directly to each other. A data store cannot connect to an external entity. An external entity must interact with a process, okay, not a data store. Other errors, incorrectly labelling processes or data flows, um, including more than nine processes on a data flow diagram, not really good because then you're adding a lot of complexity. If you think you've got more processes that you should be representing, that's when you need to think of creating a higher level process and then exploding that into child levels as opposed to having 15 processes at the diagram zero level. So you can create higher level processes, then explode those into child diagrams. Other errors, omitting flows of data and creating unbalanced decomposition or explosion in child diagrams. But unbalanced, unbalanced decomposition, I mean that your flows coming in and out aren't being represented as you expand and show lower levels of diagrams. So again, forgetting to include a data flow or pointing an arrow in the wrong direction. Okay, so this process here, calculate gross pay, we've got employee record data coming into the process, we've got employee time record coming into the process, we've got gross pay coming into the process. So it's a process, it's processing information, but there's no information actually being produced by that process. So what's actually happened here well, what do you think has actually happened here? So the gross pay arrow is actually going the wrong way. Okay, one would assume because it's calculating gross pay, we need as inputs to that process, the employee record and the employee time record, we then calculate the gross pay and the gross pay would become an output of that process rather than an input. So we've got all the, the flows of information here, we've labelled them correctly, but you can see just a simple error such as putting the arrow in the wrong direction will give you an error, okay, because there's nothing coming out of that process. Um, you can't connect data stores directly to another data store, okay. There's got to be some sort of processing that occurs in between. So you can't connect data stores and external entities directly to each other. Again, some typical examples shown in a payroll example. Um, this is what I showed previously, the calculate gross pay. Process one has no output. An external entity should not directly connect to a data store. So employee cannot provide data straight into the employee data file. The employee needs to interact with a process and the process must then store that information. The process two has no input. So process two, calculate withholding amount, has no input. Therefore, the gross pay data flow is going in the wrong direction. So that's causing an error for both processes. And again, the data store should not directly connect to another data store. There's got to be some processing that occurs in between. Now, here are some examples of data flows that we've got in the RMO system. So, just giving you some examples of uh, what's in the actual book. Um, so, the notes that I've been showing up until now are a combination of the textbook and from Kendall and Kendall. But you'll see it's, it's very similar regardless of, of what we look at. Um, it's just that Kendall and Kendall, because they do follow the traditional approach in their book, they've obviously got a lot more detail in terms of the rules and, and how to represent the diagrams. So here we've got, um, what are the things that we've got represented in this diagram? It's a context diagram. You tell me now, what are these symbols and what are they representing? External entities. External entities are which ones? Ask someone else. Which ones are the external entities? on this diagram? Squares. 
the squares, okay? So how many external entities do we have in this context diagram? Eight, okay, we've got eight external entities. Okay, we've got eight external entities. Um, what else is represented in this diagram? What else do we have? Yeah, we have a real-time link between the system and a credit bureau, some credit information that's obviously being handled or processed outside of the system, but it's a real-time link. What else do we have in this, in this context diagram? We've got data flows. So we've got data flowing in, we've got data flowing out. To add to your example here, to show we can have an external entity with a source of information coming in, we can have multiple sources of information coming out. When we explode this system, if we, we, and we show the customer with the, whatever process we're exploding, we still need to have the one flow coming in and the two flows coming out. So it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship where we have one external entity with one flow of information. There can be multiple flows of information that the external entity either provides into the system or receives from the system. So we've got external entities, we've got a real-time link, we've got our data flows, and what's the final thing shown in the context diagram? The process, and that main process should actually represent what? What should that main process represent? Everything. Everything in terms of what? What do we mean by everything? What do we generally put inside here? What do we label this? The system. The system. What is the system in question? What is the system that we are trying to figure out? What is the system that we are gathering the requirements for? Okay, what, are the, what is the system that we are modelling the requirements for? In this case, it's a customer support system. And as part of that customer support system, we have some external entities interacting with that system. We have some data flowing into the system. We have some data being produced by the system. And we also have this system interacting with the credit bureau via a real-time link. And that's pretty much all you show on a context diagram. It's a top-level view of the system itself, who it's interacting with, um, the ways the interactions occur in terms of data flowing in and data flowing out, and whether there's any interaction with a, um, a real-time link. The real-time link is not compulsory, by the way. You don't always assume that a system has this interaction with an external system. So you don't always necessarily see um, a real-time link on a context diagram. Um, with the multi-directional data flow, is that like allowed? Are you allowed to have multi-directional data flows with the shipping? Um, or should that be two um, data flows? One I'm glad you pointed that out. It's, I would say it's not a good convention, and that's something I, I would have pointed out, but I'm glad you pointed it out. I would, if in the instance that you need to create something like this, I would show it separately, because it's unclear, and or instantaneously you've picked up like an anomaly or something that's unclear, and if it's unclear at this level, it may be unclear at other levels as well. So, so I was thinking if you exploded this into a diagram zero, then we you wouldn't. Be well, relieved. that's right. But not only that, you don't know from looking at this what is the actual data that's flowing in, what is the data that's flowing out. Because if it's the same data flowing in and same data flowing out, it's not really being processed, is it? So yes, I would change this. Um, to probably the order and the back order coming in or the fulfillment detail. It's, again, it's unclear. It's already produced some sort of um, inconsistency or anomaly because you're not sure what's going in and what's coming out. So definitely get into the habit. And different authors, again, use different approaches, but I would have it as, as separate lines, okay? So what we can also do is we've got um, a customer support system for RMO, which also has four, four subsystems, being the order entry subsystem, 
the order fulfilment subsystem, the customer maintenance subsystem, and the catalog maintenance subsystem. What you can also do at this level is you can create for each of those subsystems their own context diagrams. So we have a context diagram for the RMO order entry subsystem, which is the order entry subsystem here. where we have these interactions with, the, again, the credit, credit bureau, customer, bank, shipping, management, accounting. Otherwise, you can look at um, subsystems and breaking them down is through looking at something called DFD fragments. So we can break it down even further and we can look at, and I'm just going to flick backwards and forwards a couple of slides here. We have the order entry subsystem, which has a number of processes or use cases involved. Those use cases are look up item availability, create new order, update order, produce order reports, and produce transaction reports. Those five things I've just read out to you are these five things here. Okay, so we've identified a subsystem, we've identified three, four, five processes or use cases. We can then look at those individually and create data flow diagram, DFD fragments, where we look at each of those processes and then determine for each of those processes which is the external entity they interact with and which data flows are impacted or impact this particular process. You can, and I'm going to show that's that's basically what it looks like. Okay, but if if you're not, there's a couple of approaches. You can either go straight to the explosion of it, or you can create data flow diagram fragments. It's not necessary, but there's just a different approach to modelling it at, at different levels. And uh, I guess an intermediary step that you could do by using your fragments to then help you get to this here. Because sometimes people can't intuitively get from the context diagram zero, a context diagram level to the, to the next level down. If you're having trouble difficulty, uh, if you're having difficulty doing that, then data flow diagram fragments is another way of going. Creating your fragments then combining them. What they've actually done here for simplicity is they've actually combined all of these data stores into one data store. Okay, one data store with everything. But you will see that all of these actually appear here, here, the real-time link with our update order and Credit Bureau, Update Order and Credit Bureau actually appears here. We've got one, two, three, four, five. We've got one, two, three, four, five. Just to give an example, five has got transaction summary reports. Five has got transaction summary reports going to accounting. Okay? So different ways you can represent the information at different levels. So does that mean you need to um, just associate this diagram with the fragments to know exactly which information is going yes. to which data store? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So a couple of, that's why I'm showing you just like different variations, but they're all basically showing essentially the same thing. It's just different means and mechanisms of getting to it and levelling. Um, sometimes um, again, this one here is actually going to a child diagram. So you can see an example of a child diagram where we have, which one is being expanded? Number two. So you can see how the numbering is really important. Um, create new order is being exploded even further to 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4. Again, some authors' conventions show the external entities, some don't. So I guess the message is that 
you need to really understand or, or just to be aware that there's different ways of, of modelling systems. We've got our traditional approach, we've got our object-oriented approach. Not everybody use a, 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 uses a specific approach. Obviously, the newest approach is the object-oriented approach, which we've been covering in the last nine weeks. Um, but I think it's also important to understand that there is the traditional approach to modelling requirements. So today we've looked at data flow diagrams, looking at external entities, looking at our system, looking at flows that go into a system and information that comes out of a system, looking at the top level diagram, which is our context diagram. Then once we explode that diagram, we should be thinking about exploding that into no more than nine processes, so seven plus or two processes. So we have an explosion of other processes. The flows of data coming in and out must match what you showed in your context diagram. The number of external entities much, must match at your diagram zero level what you showed on your context diagram. There are some rules to how you can connect data, um, some rules to some ways that external entities interact with processes versus not data stores directly, some common errors that we see um, that you need to be wary of when labelling your data flows and how you're joining your data flows. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. So today, yep, data flow diagrams. Next week, we'll look at some ways of um, further representing um, using process descriptions. Okay, so we'll have a look at that next week. All right. Thanks.